Hello friends, it is me, Mr. JJ. It's a very hot day in Vancouver today. So if there is one thing that I really like, it is The Simpsons. I am a super hardcore Simpsons fan, having seen every episode multiple times. That's right, even though I am 36 years old, I am not one of those hipster millennial types who stopped watching the show the second I graduated from high school and proceeded to spend the next two decades telling anyone within earshot that the show coincidentally got bad the exact moment I stopped caring about it. But anyway, I come to you today to debunk one of the most obnoxious Simpsons memes of our time. This idea that the show has some sort of awe-inspiring track record of predicting the future. If you Google a phrase like Simpsons predictions, you will find you get an endless flow of sensationalistic clickbait stories like The Simpsons has predicted the future many times. Here's the list. All the Simpsons predictions that came true. 18 times The Simpsons accurately predicted the future. 21 moments from The Simpsons that will 200% freak you out because they 100% predicted the future. Literally, the entire internet is packed to the freaking gills with this stuff. Virtually every major news outlet has reported on this phenomenon at some point. And let's not even get into the billions of YouTube videos about it. Because here's the thing, it is all complete garbage. In fact, I dare say this is the single stupidest internet viral craze since the Mandela effect. And today I shall explain why. Now this idea that television shows or books or movies or whatever can occasionally predict the future is a pretty stale cliche that has been around in some form or another as long as fiction has existed. If you visit the website TV Tropes, you can find lots of fun examples under their pages on Life Imitates Art or Hilarious in Hindsight or Funny Aneurysm. The earliest example I could find of someone singling out The Simpsons for this in particular comes from this August 2010 article from a guy named Sam Greenspan, writing at a blog called 11 Points. Sam was inspired to do this because 2010 was the year that the famous Simpsons episode, Lisa's Wedding, took place. That episode was made in 1995, but was supposed to take place 15 years in the future, with all the future stuff based on comical extrapolations of 90s era trends. So Sam wanted to see how much they got right, which, as you might expect, were a couple of things. And tonight, the following celebrities have been arrested. Remember, if you see any celebrities, consider them dangerous. Then came an article in 2013 from BuzzFeed's Jen Lewis, entitled 21 Times The Simpsons Bizarrely Predicted the Future. This was a much less inspired list of just 21 links to various news stories that kinda sorta resembled something that had happened on The Simpsons at some point. Like how some guy in Texas stole somebody's lemon tree once, or how they opened a chocolate-themed amusement park in China. Because remember, Homer once had that dream about the land of chocolate. Then in 2014, the Simpsons themselves took credit for predicting that year's Super Bowl. They sent out a tweet showing a scene from a 2005 episode where Homer is watching a game between Denver and Seattle. Although the game he was watching in that episode wasn't supposed to be the Super Bowl, and in Homer's game, unlike the real one. Oh, the Broncos won! So really, all that The Simpsons predicted was that Denver would play Seattle someday in some context, which they had already done many dozens of times by that point. So there was clearly at least some history of people looking to The Simpsons as an omen of the future. But if you look at this little chart I made, you can see that there was a dramatic uptick in Simpsons Predicts the Future articles right around here in November of 2016. And why is this? What happened in November of 2016? Oh yeah, this. Donald Trump wins the presidency of the United States. Now, like most people, I remember quite vividly where I was the night that Donald Trump was elected. I was sitting in front of the TV at my friend Rachel's apartment with my newly purchased iPad in hand. And I remember scrolling through Twitter and seeing some reporter send out a glum tweet that went something like, a 16 year old joke from The Simpsons is now our reality. And he posted a link to this clip. As you know, we've inherited quite a budget crunch from President Trump. I can't remember the exact reporter or how he phrased it, but it doesn't matter because a million other people were all tweeting the same clip as well. And the virality of that clip in the aftermath of Donald Trump's shockingly unexpected election is what kicked off this whole cliche of The Simpsons' amazing predictive powers. Now let us do a deep analysis of that clip for a bit. So this is a scene from an episode called Bart to the Future, 
the 17th episode of The Simpsons' 11th season. It aired on the 19th of March in the year 2000. It was the second ever Simpsons episode where a significant portion of the action took place in some imagined future, in this case a future where Lisa has been elected President of the United States. In the episode, Lisa has just been elected President, and at one point she sits down in the Oval Office for her first major briefing from her aides, and she says the line about inheriting the budget crunch from President Trump, which then leads into this big thing about how America is in the midst of a very severe debt crisis in the future, which is a big part of the plot of the rest of the episode. The Trump line is a single passing joke as part of this set up and is the only reference in the entire episode to Trump having been president. Okay, but why did the Simpsons in the year 2000 go with Trump of all people? Seems like a pretty random prediction, right? Well, I can tell you an interesting story about that. So according to this 2009 article in The Independent, written by a former Simpsons writer, the whole process of making a Simpsons episode takes 10 months, which means that Bart to the Future probably started life sometime around May of 1999. And what was going on in America around May of 1999, you ask? Well, the start of the 2000 presidential election, for one. By spring of 1999, Vice President Al Gore had already begun campaigning for the Democratic Party nomination, which he was expected to easily clinch, while the Republican primary was more competitive, with many declared candidates, including future President George W. Bush. But what is interesting about the 2000 election is that it occurred during this brief period of time in which the media was treating America as if it had a three-party system. You see, the two presidential elections of the 1990s had both featured a surprisingly strong third-party candidacy by an eccentric billionaire named Ross Perot, who had created his own party, known as Reform. Perot won 19% of the vote in the 1992 election, and 8% in the 1996 one, which to this day is still the best ever third party presidential showing in the last 50 years. So that being the recent history, it made perfect sense to be treating reform as basically one of America's kind of borderline major parties circa 1999. Even if the prospect of a reform party president seemed highly unlikely, the party still had a strong potential to at least affect the outcome of the race, you know, with like vote splitting or whatever. Now, what exactly the reform Reform Party believed, other than Americans needed a third choice, wasn't always clear. Perot had his own theories of what that third choice should look like, but since he wasn't running again, the debate was wide open. And before long, two leading Reform Party presidential candidates emerged. One was a guy called Patrick Buchanan, a former Nixon staffer and political commentator, who said that the problem with the American two-party system was that the two parties were to alike. So he said that reform should become a sort of hard-edged nationalistic third option in favor of protectionism and isolationism and lower immigration. And then this other guy came along and said that no, the problem with the American two-party system is that the two parties are way too different. What was actually needed was a candidate of the principled center, someone who could pick and choose the best ideas from both sides rather than being a slave to the rigid ideology of left or right. And that man's name was Donald Trump. It's always been really interesting to me that Donald Trump's first campaign for president is so forgotten today. I guess it's because that Trump back then ran on such a completely different platform than the one he would proceed to get elected on 17 years later. For example, in the 2000 election, Trump spent a lot of time denouncing Buchanan for being too racist. As you can see in this 1999 C-SPAN clip, featuring Trump's once and future advisor, Roger Stone. Although he is very proud about the fact that he has joined the party, uh, and he would like to support the party's nominee if he is not the party's nominee, uh, I think he'd have serious problems supporting Pat Buchanan, given the things that Mr. Buchanan has written about Jews and blacks and Mexicans uh, and his revisionist views of World War II. Although, on the other hand, a lot of Trump's campaign rhetoric from that time did sound very familiar. Like 
The other big thing that Trump's first candidacy had in common with his second is that he really had to fight against this perception that he was not serious. Many people said he was just running for president to self-promote and push this book he had recently written, a manifesto of political centrism called The America We Deserve. Now, the thing you have to remember about Trump in those days is that this was a time when his reputation was possibly at its lowest. This was several years before The Apprentice got started and shortly after his third bankruptcy and second divorce. So at this point, Donald Trump was seen mostly as this sort of pathetic, washed up tabloid figure from the 1980s, a sort of D-rate pseudo-celebrity in deep denial about his loss of relevance, which in turn made his run to be head of the Reform Party feed into what was then a growing narrative at the time, namely that in the absence of Perot's leadership, reform was descending into farce. Here, check out this editorial cartoon from the Richmond Times Dispatch I had the good sense to save 17 years ago. So it says, really strange bedfellows, and then we have a bed labeled Reform Party. And in the bed, we have Donald Trump, and then Jesse Ventura, who was a former pro wrestler who had recently been elected the Reform Party governor of Minnesota. And then here's Mr. Perot, and beside him is Patrick Buchanan, who is dressed as a caveman because a lot of people really saw him as this super right-wing, regressive, backwards oaf, including, as we said, Donald Trump himself. In fact, at one point, the Reform Party primary was seen as such a clown show that Gary Trudeau, the cartoonist behind the comic strip Doonesbury, announced that one of his characters would be running in it as well. Uncle Duke even got interviewed on Larry King. I want to shake things up in Washington. I want to be the ferret in the pants of government. And in the end, when Trump finally abandoned what the New York Times described as his brief and flamboyant run for president, and one of the stranger episodes of the 2000 presidential race, he would heap a lot of blame for his failed candidacy on the general dysfunction of the Reform Party. Okay, so hopefully you now understand the full context of this three second joke. The writers of The Simpsons were clearly trying to come up with some quick gag about some ludicrous political figure from 1999 somehow winding up as president in the near future. It would sort of be like if someone today made a joke about Marianne Williamson being president in the year 2050. All right, now that I have explained the crap out of that, let us focus on the second half of this terrible viral phenomenon, which is this picture here. I suspect you have probably seen this picture a lot because it is the most commonly used picture in memes describing how The Simpsons predicted Trump. And it is a pretty uncanny picture, isn't it? I mean, same escalator, same podium and sign, wow. And all the way back in 2000, you say? Well, of course, this is all complete lies. As I said, Trump never actually appears in that 2000 episode where he is briefly mentioned as a former president. In fact, Donald Trump had never appeared on The Simpsons at all up until that point. So the picture is a hoax. But it is not a complete fraud. As the Snopes people might say, it is a real picture, inaccurate description. See, the Fox Network has this YouTube channel called Animation Domination, where they air previews for their upcoming animated shows, and sometimes they make original content for it as well. On July 7th, 2015, Animation Domination posted a short cartoon promoting The Simpsons' 27th season, called Trumptastic Voyage. It was an exclusive one and a half minute skit made especially for the channel and never part of any larger episode. And most significantly, it was posted several weeks after Donald Trump announced that he would be a candidate in the 2016 presidential election. That announcement happened on June 16th, 2015. So Trumptastic Voyage is a very explicit after the fact satire of everything that happened on that famous day. The escalator and the press conference and everything. It even uses a clip of Trump's actual voice. I am officially running. The plot of the clip, such as it is, is about Homer sort of being hypnotized by Trump's hair and having this whole fantasy about it. And much like those clips of Trump from 1999, Trumptastic Voyage is a sort of weird thing to look at with today's eyes. It contains all of these 2015 era criticisms of Trump that are basically forgotten now, like how he paid people to attend that first rally and how all of these companies had been canceling him recently for saying offensive stuff. But then Trump was elected and it didn't take long 
before people began dishonestly mashing up these two unrelated Simpsons moments in order to create an urban legend that The Simpsons had predicted Trump's presidency with perfect accuracy 16 years ago. And once that became this huge viral sensation, it created increased market demand for more examples of how The Simpsons had supposedly predicted the future. In journalism, they often say that you need at least three examples to prove a trend. So the internet hive mind began madly scouring through old episodes of The Simpsons in order to scrape up whatever tiny piece of evidence they could to prove this predetermined conclusion. And by and large, all of the examples that they were able to turn up that you see in the memes and on the news sites and all the rest of it are deeply, deeply underwhelming for anybody that has any sort of reasonable standards of fortune telling, like say this screen grab, which supposedly shows The Simpsons predicting September 11th. This image comes from a much loved episode from 1997, where the family visits New York City. Lisa at one point talks about how cheap it is to visit New York by bus and holds up this ad. And then Bart is like, nine bucks? Hey, this one's on me. I really don't see how this predicts 9-11 in any way other than the fact that there's a big number nine and there's the Twin Towers and they kind of look like the number 11. But by this logic, you could say that the 911 emergency hotline predicted 9-11 too. I've seen this picture thrown around a lot as well. This is from a 2002 episode and is supposed to be a prediction of the global Ebola outbreak of 2014. I guess some people are not aware that the Ebola virus existed before 2014 and that it is a disease that is often associated with jungle animals like monkeys. <laughs> now this next one is legit kind of funny. In an episode from 1998, we get a brief glimpse of a sign that says 20th Century Fox, a division of Walt Disney Co. This is of course part of the Simpsons long running bite the hand that feeds them joke about how lame and pathetic the Fox network is. So the idea of portraying them as subordinate to their corporate rival makes a lot of sense by this logic. But then in 2018, Disney actually did buy Fox for $71 billion, which does make this joke seem kind of predictive in hindsight, although there is nothing pathetic about being bought for $71 billion. Beyond that, a lot of the other standard Simpsons predicted it examples that you tend to see are incredibly lame. Like, oh, the Simpsons made a joke about corruption in professional soccer. Wow, they sure went out on a limb with that one. Or a joke about Siegfried and Roy being mauled by their own tigers. Man, that's something that no one except the Simpsons had ever thought of before. And oh look, they predicted Zoom because they depicted a future person talking on a video phone to someone else. As if video phones were not the single most common technological prediction of the pre-internet age. But the real dark side to all of this is when people are so desperate for shares that they create fake Simpsons pictures in order to score a cheap viral hit. Like someone drew this incredibly vulgar drawing of Chief Wiggum with his knee on the throat of a black guy. And then a bunch of people started passing it around and being like, oh look, the Simpsons predicted George Floyd. Lisa's even holding up a sign that says, justice for George, and certainly that's not suspiciously on the nose at all. And then there's this fake image of Trump in a casket, which I guess means that he's gonna die in office because the Simpsons can predict everything. Very thrilling to the morbid set. So I often feel like one of the big imperatives of our time is for people, especially young people, to get much better at critical thinking. I've been really bothered a lot lately by the growing online popularity of conspiracy theories and fake news. And here I mean like genuine fake news in the sense of websites that just publish outright lies, not like some editorial column that just has a mild partisan bias you disagree with. The only real way you can immunize yourself against this kind of stuff is by working hard to develop strong instincts of skepticism and curiosity and deepening your knowledge about the world around you including by studying history. And not just history in the sense of like the Civil War or whatever. I'm talking about like the history of just the last 10 or 20 years. Ideally, this is a process that should begin early. Refusing to fall for stupid Simpsons memes is a good start. I will see you all next week. Oh yes, and one last thing, we are in the final 24 hours for my Canada Mon Kickstarter. This is a Canada-themed cartoon book I have been raising funds for for a while now. If you're interested in reserving a copy of it for yourself, get in there while you still can.